Welcome to the Open Forum, a telephone talk program designed to give you the opportunity to ask questions and discuss issues related to the Bible. Our host is Harold Camping of Family Stations Incorporated. The phone number is 1-800-322-5385. That's 1-800-322-5385. When you call, allow the phone to keep ringing. Your call will be answered when it is time for you to be on the air. When your call is taken, please be ready to turn your volume down. Our phone number is 1-800-322-5385. Now we present Open Forum with our host and Bible teacher, Harold Camping. Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? The Bible is the Word of God, and therefore we are delighted, we are in fact amazed that we can use it as the authority, as the guidebook, as the resource book for this program. Anytime we are looking for truth, we want to check out the Bible to see what it has to say. Why? Because the Bible is the Word of God. It is God's book that he has given to the human race so that we might know ultimate truth. It is utterly dependable, altogether trustworthy. It is the final authority in every area in which it speaks. And my, my, if we become acquainted with the Bible, we find that it gets into a whole lot of areas of our life. No book in the Bible, in the world, is of uh, nearly as important as the Bible is. So what a great privilege it is that on this program, this, the Bible is our authority. But this is your program. Now, before we take our first call from our telephone line, again, as we normally do, we want to take a question from somewhere uh, elsewhere in the world. We... Family Radio's programming reaches into so many areas of the world. Here we have a listener in Nigeria for you tonight. Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? The Bible is the Word of God, and therefore we are delighted, we are in fact amazed that we can use it as the authority, as the guidebook, as the resource book for this program. Anytime we are looking for truth, we want to check out the Bible to see what it has to say. Why? Because the Bible is the Word of God. It is God's book that he has given to the human race so that we might know ultimate truth. It is utterly dependable, altogether trustworthy. It is the final authority in every area in which it speaks. And my, my, if we become acquainted with the Bible, we find that it gets into a whole lot of areas of our life. No book in the Bible in the world is of uh, nearly as important as the Bible is. So what a great privilege it is that on this program, this, the Bible is our authority. But this is your program. Now, before we take our first call from our telephone line, again, as we normally do, we want to take a question from somewhere uh, elsewhere in the world. We Family Radio's programming reaches into so many areas of the world. Here we have a listener in Nigeria, Africa. Nigeria. And it's a very simple question. When is the rapture? Now, as I've indicated many times, the word rapture is not found in the Bible. But most theologians agree that when they use the word rapture, it is the time when all of the believers will, will be caught up to be with Christ in the air, those who have 
formerly <clears throat> lived on the earth, <clears throat> they will be resurrected in their glorified spiritual body and also caught up to be with the Lord Jesus. We read about that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where God indicates that that uh, this will occur. We read about it in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, where God says, We'll not all sleep, but we'll all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. And that is at the moment when we are caught up to be with Christ. Now, the fact is that the rapture, that is when all of this is occurring, is at the end of the world. I admit that that idea is contrary to an, the major teachings of the churches and congregations or theologians and Bible teachers of our day. It's very commonly taught that the rapture will occur and then will be followed a thousand years of Christ reigning from Jerusalem and then the end of the world will come. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that at all. We read in John 6, in John 6, and these are very, very pertinent words, and uh, these, this is the word of God. This is God speaking. He says in verse 39, And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Oh, to be raised up is the last day. Uh, and, and so that means it has to be the end of the world. Verse 40 of John 6, And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Because this is such a fun, f fundamental question and of such great importance, Again, in verse 44, Jesus says, "In uh, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. And then verse 54, four times in this one chapter we find, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 54, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And then in John 12, verse 48, Christ indicates that this word will judge the unbelievers on the last day. That means judgment day and the rapture have to be simultaneous. That's exactly what we read in John 5, verse 28 and 29, where God says, that the hour cometh when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come forth, some to the resurrection of judgment and some to the resurrection of life. And this is only one series of verses that emphasize the rapture is the last day. It's the end of the world. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, and uh, since the end of the world is so very close, it means the rapture is very close. It means that it won't be long. And all of us who are believers, whether we are young or old, whether we have just been saved a day or whether we've been saved for many, many years, it won't be long and we'll all be with the Lord Jesus Christ and be with him forevermore. And unfortunately, that will be the end of God's salvation plan. There is nothing more. The last day signifies that the end of the world has come and that now there is judgment day. My, my, that is why we are so grateful that we can send the gospel out into the world and know that it's still the day of salvation, can know that God is still saving a great multitude which no man can number. Isn't that wonderful to contemplate? Well, I really want to thank the listener in Nigeria for his question. And now, shall we go to our first caller on our telephone lines? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening. Um, I was wondering if you might be able to explain a little bit about uh, original sin or, you know, well, the first... Yes, see, the problem is that we read in, in Romans 
as uh, uh, that, uh, or or in actually in First Corinthians chapter fifteen, as in uh, Adam all sin, as in Adam all sin. Adam was the father, the progenitor of the whole human race. In principle, we were all in his loins. And when he sinned, the infection of sin came into the human race so that we are already under the wrath of God just because we're human. We, we uh, have the infection of sin within us. And that is seen dramatically as soon as we're able to show our feelings. The little baby that's just born already can cry uh, in protest at uh, whatever is happening around it. Uh, and as the child gets a little older, it gets more, it, we see it, an obstinate streak in it. It will not obey the way it should. That is because that child already is infected with sin, and it's proven as we sin, see sin develop in the life of every single human being. Do we know what that sin was that, that uh, Adam, uh, Adam did? I'm sorry? The, the sin that Adam committed, do, do, does the Bible say what that sin was? Oh, it does, very definitely. You read Genesis chapter 3, and God had commanded our first parents, Adam and Eve, you are to take care of the beautiful garden in which you're living and, and care for the trees and so on, and you may eat of the fruit of it, but there's one tree that I've planted here. God called it the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He gave it a very exotic name and said, you cannot eat of that fruit because in the moment you do, you will die. That is, you're going to be under the wrath of God. And lo and behold, the time came when first Eve ate of the fruit and then Adam ate of the fruit. So they, that was an act of rebellion against God. That was an act of sin. And that brought them into that situation of being under the wrath of God forevermore. The only solution to their predicament, or, and this is the same solution that is available to every human being, is the, uh, is the blood of the Lord Jesus. If we have come to trust in him, if God causes us uh, to, to uh, become saved, then we escape the wrath of God simply because it means that Christ has taken the guilt that we have had, and he made the payment of the uh, penalty demanded by the law of God for that sin. I think you answered in the sense of, because like you were saying, the day that you eat it, you will die, and, and they didn't physically die, but I guess you explained how they came under the wrath of God then. Yes, well, see, the death, uh, eventually they did physically die, and that was the evidence that they had come into spiritual death. The death that God had in view was the wrath of God that ended up into the second death, eternal damnation. Cause, will you look at a verse with me real quick, sir? Yes. Uh, Hebrews 2.15, that explains a lot about what you're talking about, I think, then, uh, in light of what you said. Hebrews 2.15, there we read, uh, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Yes, that's exactly uh, a statement that is describing God's salvation plan. The one who can deliver us or save us is the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, let's couple that with verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, talking about the Lord Jesus. Now, Christ himself was without sin, but in order to be our Savior, he had to take upon himself the sins of those that he planned to save, that through death, that is his death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Now, uh, that's one of the corollary pieces of uh, or the facts that did happen, that when Christ paid for our sins, he also brought a death blow to Satan, who is the one in the Garden of Eden who first tempted Eve to fall into sin and who is uh, constantly uh, trying to get people to, to get deeper into sin. Thank you so much for calling and sharing. 
And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, my question is actually what you were just talking about, about Thessalonians 17. Uh, then which we are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Um, in relation to revelations, now I take revelations to be very literal. Um, Revelation 13.3. Revelation 13.3. And I saw one of the heads that were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. Yes. Now, you don't think that this beast was very literal, an actual beast that came out of the sea with seven heads and ten horns, do you? No, I believe that it is literal in the way that the devil will indwell Oh, well, excuse me. In other words, you do not believe in correctly. You are correct, of course. This is not to be understood as a literal beast that we could uh, uh, take a picture of with seven heads and ten horns, but it is a picture of Satan, and the, the crowns. when the crowns are on the seven heads, it's a rule of Satan throughout the uh, time of the Earth's existence. But in this case, the... The uh, the uh, the horns are crowned, and that has to do with the rule of Satan during the Great Tribulation period, and and uh, what further develops in Revelation 13 is the situation in the churches and congregations as Satan rules there. He uh, he. Uh, uh, first of all, he's pictured as a beast that comes out of the sea. Then he's pictured as a beast that comes out of the earth. The same, it's still Satan. And he has, now he has two horns as a lamb because he looks like Christ. And, uh, and, uh, but it's discussing how he rules during the Great Tribulation, particularly over the churches and congregations. Okay. Um... My next question about the same thing, and then I'll get off and listen, is that the world is going to be um, supposedly marvel at the miracles that are performed at this by this second beast. Because you go down here at 1312, it says, And he exercises all the power of the first beast, and causes the earth of them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. And... Um, 14, deceive them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. All right. What is your, what is your question? My question is, um, this, what are the actual miracles that the world are going to marvel oh, at that well, are going to make them believe that it's well, God? You, you know, to couple this with Matthew 24, verse uh, uh, 24, False prophets and false Christ, because it's talking about the same period of time. False prophets and false Christ will arise with signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Now, signs and wonders, those that uh, means they they come with miracles. Now, uh, what kind of miracles? In Second Thessalonians two, it speaks about Satan coming with miracles, lying miracles. There are two kinds that are in evidence in, in all over the world in churches and congregations. First of all, there are false miracles. That is deception, chicanery, where it looks like people have had a miraculous healing of some kind, but actually it's a put-on. It's, uh, it's a deception performed by the evangelist or the preacher in order to cause people to believe in their kind of a gospel. And there's a lot of that going on. Yeah. Secondly, there are true miracles. That is supernatural activity. Uh, uh, one is where people occasionally do receive a message from Satan. They think they get, are getting it from God in some kind of an unknown language called a tongue. And uh, that, that uh, is supernatural in many cases. 
and so it looks like a true miracle or uh, they may receive occasionally a a vision that is supernatural and uh, and that will look up, be looked upon as a miracle more uh, in evidence is the miracle of people falling backward and this can be seen all over the world in our day and it's spoken of here in Revelation 13 as calling down fire from heaven it can be shown from the Bible that falling backward and calling down fire from heaven are, uh, are synonymous that, uh, that uh, falling backward is a picture of calling down fire from heaven and that's a miracle that is happening the uh, people who are engaged in this call that slain in the spirit. It is presumably showing that the ruler in that church, who tends, who of course is Satan, although they don't, they think it is Christ, but it is Satan who is trying to prove that he is a judge. He is exactly like God, because to call down fire from heaven is a figure of bringing judgment. And so those are the miracles that are in evidence all over the world today okay and my last question what exactly is the deadly wound well the deadly wound is a figure of speech to indicate it says one of the heads received a death blow it means that when Christ went to the cross he vanquished Satan remember it was Satan who finally bound Christ he was standing there uh, in, he had infilled Judas and he was there with the temple servants and they bound Jesus and brought him to trial and finally the Pharisees shouted uh, uh, crucify him, crucify him and indeed uh, he was crucified and so it it looked like Satan was getting his way he, he didn't realize of course that this is exactly what God intended for Jesus he was he had to endure all of this that was going on as payment for the sins of those that he had come to save but in the process of this uh, because he faithfully uh, received the the uh, punishment of eternal damnation the equivalent of eternal damnation as payment for sin it guaranteed that Satan and all the wicked of the world who are not saved also will receive that same uh, punishment, that same death blow, which is which has to do with eternal damnation, and and so uh, Satan became a defeated foe. Uh, however, uh, and and for over 1,900 years, as God is evangelizing the world by the churches and congregations, Christ restrained Satan. He he. He, uh, 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 we read in uh, Revelation 20 that uh, he shut uh, Satan up in a in a pit. That is, he he uh, uh, severely restrains Satan, even though he's able to go about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he might devour. Nevertheless, he cannot keep could not keep the churches from accomplishing the accomplishing the work God had assigned to them, namely to be his evangelists to bring the gospel to the world. But uh, at, the, uh, at the beginning of the tribulation, Christ loosed Satan, and so now he's able to plague the churches uh, to accommodate this. The Holy Spirit has been taken out of the midst, and this allows Satan to take the word that is being proclaimed and, and so that it is not does not find root in the hearts of those who uh, who are listening, who are still unsaved. And so uh, uh, he, he uh, uh, appears to be the victor temporarily. But uh, on the last day, Christ will come, and, and the first thing that will happen is Satan will be uh, cast into hell. Okay, well, well, I think you've answered what I needed to know. Thank you. Thank, thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, I was wondering, um, could uh, part of um, calling fire down from heaven, could that also be represented of when the tongues of fire were set upon the people in uh, Pentecost or um, Passover? No, I don't think people. so. I, I don't think there's any tie in there except that fire has to do with judgment. The tongues of fire uh, did 
It doesn't say that that came down from heaven. It doesn't say that the apostles upon whom the tongues of fire sat, that they were under the judgment of God. But it was, you notice it was tongues of fire. Tongues have to do with language. Uh, And the nature of the gospel is that it is a two-edged sword. It cuts and, and brings people to salvation, but it also cuts and damns people. It is, in another place, the Bible says, it is a savor or a fragrance of life unto life and of death unto death. The nature of the gospel is to bring judgment or to bring salvation. It is never neutral. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes. Uh, Brother Kent. Yes. Um, what do you mean that, like, people, what, do you mean that, um, when they feel the Holy Spirit, you, you, did you think, um, you saying that, uh, you think it's the devil? You said it was the devil? No, uh, are you referring to the fact that I'm saying that in the churches and congregations today, uh, God has, uh, no, uh, the Holy Spirit is no longer in the midst. Now, Satan, there, and Satan takes a seat, he's ruling. And so even as we read in, uh, let me read a verse from uh, Luke chapter 8, where God gives the parable of the sower. And in in Luke chapter 8, he says, in verse 12, earlier he had said that a sower went forth to sow, and he sowed, and some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And then the disciples wanted to know, what did that mean? And he said unto them, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Now, as long as the Holy Spirit is operating in the churches, Satan can't be there. And and so as the true gospel is being proclaimed, uh, there are those who hear that gospel and God applies that to the hearts of of those whom he plans to save, and they do become saved. However, if the Holy Spirit is no longer in the midst, and Satan is ruling there, then you you can have that same beautiful gospel being proclaimed, and it's not, it's, uh, there will not be the Holy Spirit to restrain Satan from, uh, from uh, plucking that word out, uh, up so that it, uh, it, so that it can save. This, uh, this is dramatized, of course, when we see the Lord Jesus. That was a time when Satan was very active, and, and it was a time when uh, the Lord Jesus was presenting absolutely the true gospel, but virtually nobody became saved. The Holy Spirit was not active in, in, uh, uh, in uh, restraining Satan and applying that word to the hearts of those who were hearing. But then... Satan was bound so that he could not uh, could not uh, 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 affect that word as it's being declared in the church. And right there at Pentecost, about three thousand are saved. The Holy Spirit is there to apply the word, so Satan can't be operating there. And and uh, and so. The, uh, the activity of Satan has been restrained, and there are people becoming saved. At the end of the church age, it's just the reverse. The, the Holy Spirit is withdrawn from the midst, and Satan now operates again. And we have the same condition, then, that existed in the synagogues and in the temple when Jesus was preaching, and uh, where virtually nobody was saved. Um, one more question. Yes. Um, is it bad not to uh, pray for your food? I'm sorry? Is it bad not to pray for your food? Like if you forget something? Oh, well, you, you, you know, Jesus set an example. Before he ate, he, he asked, he thanked the Lord for the food. And if Jesus does it, then that means we are to do it. We are to follow his example. And so when we are sit down to eat a meal, it is very proper that we pray the, uh, the Lord to bless that food and to thank Him for that food. 
But thank you for calling and sharing. Now, before we take our next call, we have to have a message, and then right after that, we'll take our next call. Weekday at this time, we bring you Open Forum, a telephone talk program airing questions on biblical issues. This feature of Family Stations Incorporated will continue in just a moment. I want to express to you my deepest gratitude for the Bible. My dream came true. I'm sure that God had his hand in it. He's the one who opened your hearts to our long-suffering people. Now, that was one of the many Russian letters that we received in response to our outreach to Russia. And that's why we're so thrilled to be returning to this area of the world. Lord willing... From April 29th to May 13th, we'll be going to Kiev in the Ukraine to bring our Does God Love You tracks and Russian Bibles. Is it possible that you could help us to deliver this precious gift of the gospel? Please call 1-800-543-1495 for the details. That's 1-800-543-1495. We continue with more of the Open Forum. You are invited to call in and ask questions or discuss issues that are related to the Bible. Our number is 1-800-322-5385. That's 1-800-322-5385. When your call goes on the air, please be ready to turn your volume down. Here is our host and Bible teacher, Harold Camping. We're continuing with the Open Forum program, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, good evening, Brother Camping. Uh, I have three questions I'd like to ask you. The first one is dealing with Revelations 22, 18, and 19. Yes. I'm looking at my King James Version, and it's saying that if any man shall take away from the words of the book, or if any man shall add to the uh, prophecy, how does this negate God still sending revelation? Oh, well, the, the fact is that God follows, the, is under the same rules as, uh, as mankind is. God does not have two sets of rules where he obeys his own set of rules and mankind has to obey another set. Whatever we find in the Bible, God has made himself subject to those identical rules. And so when he says, if any man... Uh, uh, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Uh, that means that God also has put, him under, put himself under that. Now, if God would violate this, if God would add something, then it would mean that some man somewhere would have to recognize that God has added something, and so it is. Uh, uh, he would be accepting the fact that that God has done this and, and has made a larger, a larger Bible than what what we have. the The rule, the rule applies uh, equally to God as well as to man. Good. Okay. My second question is dealing with uh, John 11, verse two. Also in my King James Bible, I notice that the whole verse is in parenthesis. What relevance does it have that it's in parenthesis? The, in John 11, it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. The, that verse is kind of an interjection into the narrative here, and so the translators put parentheses around it, although that is not in the original. They do not belong there. God fairly often, quite often does that, as a matter of fact. 
he goes along uh, developing a, a theme or an argument of some kind, a teaching of some kind, and he will interject within that uh, a, a seemingly irrelevant statement, but uh, we don't find parentheses around it. It just uh, let's say it this way: the publishers or the uh, the uh, translators put it there, thinking that that might help us understand the passage. From that um, explanation, then can we make a biblical assumption that this was the same Mary then? Well, yes. This uh, let's read it. Now, a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. And we find that in another account that he had done these, that she had done this, whose brother Lazarus was sick. And so it's the same Mary, the same woman question is dealing in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. In Genesis 1 they're talking about, well God is speaking about heaven, singular. Then in Genesis 2 he starts talking about, Gen I mean, he starts talking about heavens, plural. What happened that all of a sudden it became heavens, plural? What happened was that the translators did not translate accurately. Every place you see that word heaven singular, it is a plural word. Okay. It, it would have been more correct if it, they had translated the, in Genesis 1 verse 1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, and the, uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout this uh, book of Genesis we find the word heaven. I believe, I believe in almost every instance it is plural. All right, then. Thank you so much and bless you for your radio program. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good night, Mr. Campbell. Um, could you please explain Revelation 11, verse 3, the two witnesses? Um, is this chapter in the future? Because you say there are no prophets who can tell us things to come and no more miracles since the Bible is closed. And can you please explain verse 6 also? Well, the, these two witnesses are are witnessing during 260 days and we know the 260 days are the new testament era and uh, and so throughout the church age which makes up the dominant portion of that they represent the true believers in the churches and congregations that are faithfully declaring the word of god that is why they are called two olive trees olive trees uh, remind us of what we read in Romans 11 where the true believers are grafted into an olive tree. They are called two candlesticks because the church itself uh, is a candlestick uh, amongst which Christ walks. We read that in, in uh, Revelation uh, 1 in the last verse and Revelation 2 in the first verse. And so these two witnesses represent the true believers in the churches and congregations as they bring the gospel. Now they come with great power. Now it doesn't mean that they have the power, but the word of God that they are declaring has that power. If any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth. That is, those who are opposed to the uh, the uh, word of God, the fire that pursues, pursues, proceeds out of their mouth, that is the judgment of God that that the word of God declares. They are declaring the word of God and it brings judgment upon those that refuse to listen to the word of God. And, and uh, uh, it devoureth their enemies. The fact is that those who come under the judgment of God end up under eternal damnation. And then it says, if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. The, uh, the, the gospel must be obeyed, must be listened to. And if it is not listened to, those who uh, turn against it are under the wrath of God and they end up with, under the 
not a physical death, not a physical killing, but the second death, eternal damnation, which is infinitely worse than being physically killed. Now, these have power to shut heaven, that it reign not in the days of their prophecy. Uh, you see, again, it is God who is the power of the Word of God. Christ is the Word of God. And there were at least two times, uh, one time, uh, well, three times, one time very physically, when God uh, turned off the, uh, the uh, well, there were other famines before that. There was a seven-year famine during the days of uh, Joseph, but there was a three-and-a-half-year famine in the days of Elijah uh, and uh, that occurred because of the apostasy, the wickedness of the nation of Israel at that time. There was a a spiritual famine during the days of Christ. While he was proclaiming the gospel, virtually nobody became saved. The famine was that of hearing the word of God. And then, uh, right after Christ went back to heaven, God turned the water on again, the rains began to fall, and about 3,000 are saved. This is talking, of course, about a spiritual uh, famine or spiritual rain. And again, at the beginning of the Great Tribulation, there was spiritual famine, so that in the first part of the Great Tribulation, uh, virtually nobody was being saved, as near as we can tell from the Bible. But then, uh, at, at some point, God turned the uh, waters on again, in that uh, the latter rain came down, and there is a great multitude which no man can number that is being saved. And they have power to turn the waters, to turn them into blood. Now the waters, that is the gospel. And, and the blood has to do again with judgment. And those who will not hear the gospel, uh, the gospel is a judgment against them. So that uh, it, uh, it is requiring their blood. It is requiring that they be subject to the second death. Uh, in, in, in other words... These statements have all to be understood spiritually, not physically in some way. They, it is very spiritual. And this, this has to do with how it's been going on uh, ever since the, uh, the gospel has been proclaimed to the world. Actually, one more question. Yes. What is the latter rain? The latter rain is the final sending. Now, this is R-A-I-N. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 2, God declares, My doctrine, that is my teaching, shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Now that's a, a parabolic or metaphorical language to indicate that the gospel comes from heaven like rain on a dry land, and then vegetation begins to show. That is, the gospel brings life in the lives of those that God does save. They have spiritual life. Now, the latter rain is the final program of God to evangelize the world. Uh, the, God speaks of the of the church age that went on for over 1950 years from the t from Pentecost until the beginning of the Great Tribulation as the early reign. It identified with Pentecost when the first fruits, when the first harvest was coming in. Uh, but then came a period of famine, of hearing the word of God, and then that was followed by the latter reign uh, and, and wherever you see the term the latter reign in the Bible, it always is talking about the final program of God of evangelizing the world. And it's at a time when there's been an explosion of population so that in our day, when, uh, when it is the time of the latter reign, we find that there are over 6 billion people in the world and they're being added to at the rate of about 10,000 more each uh, each hour of the day so this is uh, this is the time of the latter rain and that brings in the final harvest it was typified you know by two important feast days the israelites 
observed the Feast of Pentecost that came 50 days after after the Passover and uh, they brought in the first fruits, the first harvest that, I, that identifies with the early rain. And then there was another feast of harvest that occurred on the seventh month, seventh, uh, it was six months later, uh, the, the Pentecost, uh, well actually it was about five months later, Pentecost was in the second month, but in the seventh month, uh, in the fall of the year, when the, when the harvesting was all finished, the final harvest is brought in, and the Bible speaks of a time of uh, the Feast of Ingathering, uh, it was also the, called the Feast of Tabernacles uh, and commemorated the fact that Israel finally had come into the land of Canaan. And that that is anticipating the harvest of the end of the world that is going on right now. The world is being harvested of those who are to become saved during the latter reign. And as we read in Revelation 7, it is a great number which no, or a great multitude rather, which no man could, no, can number. And they come out of great tribulation. That is, these are the ones who are saved during this time, which the Bible also speaks of as a time of great tribulation, because God's judgment is on the churches and their congregations at the same time that outside of the churches, uh, the gospel is going out and there is this tremendous harvest of souls coming in. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm on my radio. Okay. Um, I'm calling you... I called you about three weeks ago, and I know it's supposed to be only once a month, but I beg that you please take my call. I try to reach you at your private line, but you, you weren't able to accept any calls. And um, I'm really frightened. I'm the one that's been calling you saying I'm so frightened about salvation, and I'm so terrified and so tormented. And I have been reading, and I have been praying, and I have been seeking, and I know that I'm still unsaved. And I have a couple of questions. One, the first question I'm going to bring up, I'm, I'm not saying it to to slander or to persecute or anything. I'm saying it because my heart is sinking in me and I just don't know what to do on any more than I have, which is um, a couple of weeks ago you said that we could have a couple of years left, and this was a couple of weeks ago. And every day, I listen to you every day, and my heart is just crumbling as, as you're saying that we are so close to the end. We're so close to the end, and I'm thinking it's like any day, and I am so frightened that I can't sleep. I can't function. I am just so frightened. And it's like I have a friend who's a Christian, and she comes here every Thursday night. We have Bible studies here because we're not going to church or anything like that. And she says, well, while although fear is good, because only God can make you fear in a certain way, she goes, that doesn't mean that you're going to be saved. She goes, it, it could just mean that God's telling you there's hell to pay. And I just, I just don't know. I am so frightened that I think I'm going to have a heart attack. And I'm not saying that exaggerating. I'm serious. Well, the fact, you know, that's a good place to be. The Bible emphasizes the fear of God, the fear of God. That's a, that's a commodity that's not found very much today in many, many circles. And in other words, you are beginning to understand the, the, uh, the authority of the Bible, the certainty of the Bible, and the fact there is a God, and that you, uh, you uh, by your fear, you're admitting that you're a sinner, and that you uh, you deserve the wrath of God. So uh, that that in itself is not a bad thing. It's a uh, it's it's where we all ought to come to that we have a fear of God. Now the the uh, remember this that God does everything perfectly, and he and amongst other things he allows you to to pray for his mercy now that doesn't mean that through any prayer you're going to get saved but at least you can know that you are getting the uh, your your uh, need is getting into the presence of god himself and that's a luxury a wonderful luxury that god gives us uh, and and then 
Uh, so you can pray, oh God, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm on my way to hell. And oh Lord, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. And I'm so thankful that you are a merciful God. And, and remember that you can come to God again and again. The Bible says, don't be anxious about anything, but with prayer and supplication make your requests known to the Lord. But leave it there. Leave it with the Lord. And, uh, and now the question is, uh, uh, will God save you? I don't know. I don't know. But I do know this, that, uh, that he is a merciful God. And he, and he wants us to keep coming to him and coming to him. But if he is going to save you, he has his own timetable. And you can thank the Lord. That it's right now, it's the day of salvation. It's still the day of salvation. My, my. What if you didn't have that fear of God? What if you weren't imploring God? What if you were just callously going on your way, as most people in the world do, and then judgment day would overtake you? But you just leave it with the Lord, and you uh, you cry to Him, and keep crying to Him, and 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 then remind yourself, I know that God does everything perfectly. And, oh, Lord, I don't know whether you're going to save me or not, but I, I, I know that you do everything perfectly. And in the meanwhile, because, uh, because the environment of our salvation is the Word of God, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by, by the Word of God, keep reading the Bible, keep reading the Bible. And it may be, May be that somewhere along the line you begin to find that you have an enormous delight in the Word of God. You really want to be obedient to the Word of God. And then you're going to begin to get the assurance, Wow, somewhere along the line God must have saved me because I really find that that is the character of my life. I want, I have a tremendous want to, to do the will of God. And that will begin to be the evidence in all likelihood of salvation has come into your life. And I just want to thank you for saying that. I just want to say something else. And it's like, I, when you come out and say, and, and you point this out, I know how important it is for you to point this out about our sinfulness. And it's like when you just said that to me a couple of minutes, a few seconds ago, and you said that likelihood is my fear is indicating that I know I'm a sinner. See, the thing is that that's why I'm so scared is because I don't have, like, a conviction that I'm a sinner. I have an a, a, a overwhelming fear of hell that's going to kill me any one of these days, but I have, like, it's not like where I'm going, oh, I'm a sinner. Like, in other words, I, I'm pitying myself. Well, it, and I it, don't, oh, I know I need to come me, to a... Excuse me, and that is true. You... One of your problems, I'll tell you, one of your problems in all likelihood is, this is a common problem, and that is you feel uh, enormously frustrated, you feel enormously uh, ill at ease, because you can't get control of your salvation. You see, uh, by nature... We want to have control. You would like to have a salvation where you could, uh, could decide that now I'm going to get myself saved. And that is commonly taught all through Christendom that uh, you can get yourself saved. And when you're hearing that you cannot have any control over this, that it depends entirely upon the action of God, that frightens you no end because you're not in charge. And, and it, 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 you just can't get around to the idea that I have to entrust myself 100% to the Lord Jesus. And so the first thing you want to think out in your mind is, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, why am I, uh, uh, why am I so uh, frustrated and so upset? And, and, oh, Lord, just help me to trust in you and forget about it, the idea that somehow I have to be in charge of this. Many people get depressed, terribly shattered, when they find out that they are not in control of them becoming saved. That is a very scary position. But then, right then, the question is, am I able to just wait upon God? Is Can I trust Him that He will do what is right? Is Do I trust Him as the, as the very essence of perfection, even though I may not understand 
uh, anything about it. And and this 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 I think is where a major part of your problem is is you have to get up, give up the idea that you could have any control of yourself getting saved. Can you please read a scripture um, in Isaiah chapter 27, um, verse 5? Isaiah 27. Verse 5. And I wanted to know if this means anything about that we need God's strength and not ours. Because well, our yes. Strength Why strength. does it say, yeah, that's a, I'm going to read that verse in a moment, but what is, what, remember in Philippians, Jesus said, or God says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but you can't get yourself saved. But I can get, I, as I live out my life, and Christ is, is, uh, is, is indwelling me through the Holy Spirit, then I can face any situation. God will strengthen me. Now here, let him take hold of my strength, that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. And that's, that means that we're praying, Oh Lord, you take hold of me. I don't trust my strength a bit. I don't, I don't trust my will a bit. I don't trust anything about me. I have to pray that every day. Oh Lord, I don't trust my wisdom for a moment. I don't trust my ability for a moment. Oh Lord, will you work in me to will and to do of your good pleasure? That's the only way we can live because uh, my, we're just finite humans with all kinds of weaknesses and frailties and what have you. And, and we just want to look to God to do the work uh, in us. Okay, I just want to say one last thing, and that is, like, I guess I feel like, uh, you know, that I keep praying and I keep reading, and I'm trying, I'm begging God for salvation, but that because in my heart, because I've been searching my heart to know what's really in my heart, I know that in my heart I'm not coming to him totally broken. I'm not coming to him humbled and, like, ter you know, thinking I'm a filthy, rotten sinner. And so I don't know, because if he's going to work with me, like, in other words, if there was an evidence of him well, in my life. But excuse me, you see, you're not going to come in and come to him as a as a good person, as a good person. You, 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 uh, God isn't going to save you because of some goodness within you. Uh, he is going to save you because you're a sinner. And all you can do is come to God is, I'm a sinner. I have pride in my life. I have, uh, I'm not broken the way I ought to be. I'm a sinner. But, oh, Lord, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. We, we, if we think God is going to save us only because we've arrived at some measure of goodness, we'll never, never become saved. We never can become good enough. You, you go to the Lord just the way you are. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. And my sins include pride. My sins include that I'm not broken the way I should be. My sin is, uh, is, is, is there. But, oh, Lord, you have mercy on me if you would. I implore you. I beg of you. I beseech of you. And, uh, and if he saves you, then you will be broken. If he saves you, then you will I, I, I realized completely that there was nothing in you that could uh, could uh, uh, be pleasing to God. All right, and, and do you? I mean, do you know if we have any time left? I mean, I'm so scared because that was the first question I asked you, but I added so much that I got you all another yeah, place. Well, let me just say this: I can't. Help you. you have to go to God. You have to go to God, and. And, and rest your case with him. You can't, nobody can, can give you any assurance. Nobody can really uh, tell you uh, this is the formula you have to follow or you must do this or must do that. All we can do is tell you what the Bible says. And the Bible says that, that, uh, that God is the one who has to save us. And, uh, and he works through his word. So read the Bible. Read the Bible. Put, place yourself in an environment where God can apply that to your heart, and and you have the luxury, as I as I've indicated, of begging and begging and beseeching the Lord for His mercy, reminding yourself uh, as you talk with the Lord, I know that you're a merciful God, a merciful God. Have mercy, and O oh Lord, help me that that uh, you might save me so that my trust is in you and not in me in any way, so that I'm not looking 
for some worthiness in my life that makes me uh, makes me uh, uh, satisfactory to you to become saved, but that that uh, that I recognize that I'm a sinner and that my best works are as filthy rags. There's nothing that I can take credit for of any kind. Oh Lord, just have mercy on me, and may the Lord give you. I give you that desire in your heart, and now we have to go to our next, or to our next message, and then we'll go to our next caller. at this time we bring you Open Forum, a telephone talk program airing questions on biblical issues. This feature of Family Stations Incorporated will continue in just a moment. In Proverbs 11, we read that the fruit of the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth, and he that winneth souls is wise. Now, it is wise to do everything we can to win souls for the kingdom. And while we know from Scripture that God draws men and women to himself, we also know that it is the believer's responsibility as an ambassador of the gospel to preach the gospel to every creature. And radio is still one of the most cost-effective means to preach the gospel to the most people for the least amount of money spent. Family Radio needs your generous financial support during this month month in order to continue broadcasting sacred inspirational programming around the world. Have a part today in this ministry. Help us win souls to Christ. Write to Family Radio, Oakland, California, 94621. That's Family Radio, Oakland, California, 94621. Thank you. We continue with more of the Open Forum. You are invited to call in and ask questions or discuss issues that are related to the Bible. Our number is 1-800-322-5385. That's 1-800-322-5385. When your call goes on the air, please be ready to turn your volume down. Here is our host and Bible teacher, Harold Camping. We're continuing with the Open Forum, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Um, yes. I'm just calling about a uh, young lady. I I'm sorry. Could you turn your radio off, please? Go ahead with your call. Hello? Yes. Yes, hi. Um, Brother Kim, I've been listening to your show, and um, I remember you said earlier that you were saved, is that correct? Oh, I believe with all my heart that I am saved, yes. Okay, my concern is, which I, I believe you, didn't you also say that it's God's final decision that you're saved? It's oh, not I, your oh my, yes. I've asked myself a hundred times, a thousand times, why did he save me? Because I certainly am not deserving of it. Well, how do you know you're saved? Well, simply because the, what we read in First John chapter 2, verse 3, if we say we know him, that is, if we say we're saved, we will keep his commandments. And the commandments of the Bible are all the rules the, that the, that, of which the Bible consists. The Bible is a law book of God. And if we find in our heart an intense desire to do the will of God, that is, to be obedient, to all the teachings of the Bible, and and more and more we're we're actually being obedient. That is evidence that we are uh, a a child of God. But even with that, at the end of the day, it's still God's final decision to save us. Isn't that correct? Well, it's with all it all together earth. is God's decision, and that's why I say I don't know why He saved me. I have no idea. I. I, I know a lot of people that who by nature were, are probably a lot nicer people than I am by nature, and they're not saved than I am. Why would he save me? I don't know, but he did. 
I understand you told me the chapter in the Bible, but I feel that at the end of the day, even when we as human, we're imperfect, we're not worthy, you said all that, and I totally agree with you, but then what, what concerns me is that in a way you're almost telling people out there there is no chance of them ever being saved when at the end of the day you and I and any human, all human beings do not know it's God's final decision. Well, it is God's sovereign, but look, what, is, what does God say in Romans 8? We, the, the nature of a child of God is that we trust the Bible. And what does he say in verse 16 of Romans 8? The Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit himself, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's a faithful promise of God. And I take God at his word. God uh, the, that's the nature of a child of God. We trust what the Bible says. Which I completely understand, 100%. But at the end of the day, even with all of that, with our human, imperfect ways, it's still God's final decision. So we are only hoping that we are saved, even though well, we it, believe that we are going by uh, well, what the Word it, is telling us. Isn't that correct? Well, you see, until we have become saved, truly become saved, we can't understand these verses, and I, I can understand your question. Uh, if we just look at the Bible as a person studying the Bible and, and trying to be obedient to the Bible, and yet we have not become saved, we read a verse like this, and we can't understand it at all. But when we truly have become saved so that we have a new resurrected soul, and we find that uh, we are very unhappy when we fall into sin and we find that we have great delight when we do the will of God and we don't question the word of God, we are ready to be obedient to whatever we are told to do, uh, then uh, we, we uh, find that and the very fact that God the Holy Spirit indwells us also works in our life in some mysterious way then we know that we can know that we are a child of God. That that uh, the Bible is not playing games with us. It is giving us exact information. And I agree with you, Brother Camden. But that means that everyone has the opportunity to be saved. Isn't that correct? Well, everybody has the opportunity, but nobody, nobody, neither I nor anybody of ourselves want to be saved. Oh, yes, we'd like to get right with God on our own terms, but not on the terms that God gives. Nobody does. Nobody does. And the only reason I or anyone else became saved is because God decided by his sovereign will to save us. And I don't know why he selected me, as I've already indicated. I have no idea. But he did because I know that I am saved. But the fact is that by nature, nobody wants to be saved. And, and it, it, those who are saved are saved in spite of the fact that they of themselves don't want to be saved. God does save them and inclines their will to love the Lord and to want to do his will. But that almost makes it sound as though it's hopeless and helpless for people who want to change their lives around to say, well, okay, God only chose a certain number, which we know that. But at the same time, he left the Bible to show us the way to live our lives. And just like you said with the earlier caller that he didn't come for the good people. But it doesn't mean that you shouldn't still try to live by the word of God. Well, excuse me. Excuse me. You know, you said it looks hopeless. It is hopeless. Except for the grace of God, our lives are hopeless. We are in a terrible predicament. We're on our way to hell. But the hope is that Christ might be our Savior, but we have to leave that to God. And we have a hard time doing that because we want to control this thing. We want to be in charge of it. And we fail to realize that the nature of the child of God is that he recognizes that God is in complete control. He does what he wants to do. And that only comes to us, we only begin to understand that when indeed we have become saved. But uh, outside of God's sovereign good action in saving us, it is hopeless. It is utterly hopeless. But, uh, but nevertheless... The Bible is a book of hope, and 
and uh, and God is saving her. He is a merciful God, and uh, the Bible, and we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is the day of salvation. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt, a great multitude which no man can number are being saved right today, and so that gives us enormous hope that maybe that could include me too if I. No, at this moment, I'm still unsaved. Right. Thank you very much, Brother Candace. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Hello Camping. Yes. I would like to ask you a couple of questions. Like, do you want people to believe every interpretation you give in the Bible? I'm sorry, do I believe which? Do you want people to believe every interpretation you give in the, in the Scripture? Well, the Bible is not subject to private interpretation. The Bible has to be understood by comparing Scripture with Scripture. We have to be very, very careful on how we interpret the Bible to make sure that our interpretation or the understanding we come to is altogether faithful to everything else in the Bible. And that means we have to approach the Bible very humbly, or not arrogantly at all, or boastfully, or proud, pride, pridefully. We come very humble to the Bible, uh, humbly to the Bible, uh, admitting, I don't know anything, O oh Lord, you teach me, you teach me through your word. And, and we uh, uh, pray that we might lean more and more on his almighty arms, waiting for him to open our eyes as we carefully search the word yes because i feel like every time a caller called you i feel like you give the caller your own interpretation well but you see when i am giving an answer to a caller it is based on the word of god i don't just answer promiscuously i don't answer flippantly i don't answer just uh, out of my own head I wouldn't trust my mind for a minute but the answers I give are based upon what I know the Bible teaches and that's why again and again I give scriptures uh, you never hear me quoting another man another authority you, the only thing you hear me quoting is the Bible now okay another question a lot of time people called you they ask you for, for a passage and then you say you don't want to speculate. You haven't you haven't read the passage. You don't want to speculate. You doing this by your own knowledge, or you doing it by the Holy Spirit, by the knowledge of God? Well, see, that is the point. That if if I have looked at a passage and I do not understand it, I don't want to trust my own mind. I don't want to say it could uh, just this or that or the other thing because that's that's what my mind tells me until I have had an opportunity to check that verse against everything else the Bible teaches that might relate to it. Only then do I want to be, say, yes, that verse in all likelihood means this or it means that. Uh, when I say I don't want to speculate, it means I don't want to trust my mind. I haven't had an opportunity to look at that verse in the light of the whole Bible, and that's required that is required if we're going to come to truth. So that really tell you at the moment you don't have the Holy Spirit in you. Well, but just because the Holy Spirit is in me, uh, God works through his word. The sword of the Spirit is the word of God. Just because I'm a saved person and the Holy Spirit indwells me, that doesn't mean I can look at any verse and know instantly what that verse is meaning. The Bible instructs me to compare Scripture with Scripture, spiritual things with spiritual. And unless I do that, unless I follow uh, and, uh, the instructions of the Bible, which indicates I trust what the Bible is saying, God is not going to, to uh, help me in, in my search for truth. Now read First John chapter 2, verse 27 for me. John 2, verse 7. First John. First John. 2 Chapter verse 27. 27. Let's look at that. 1 John. Chapter 2. 
Verse 27, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. All right, now, ye have no need that any man teach you. We do not learn what the Bible teaches because of the wisdom of man. We don't go to other scholarly books of some kind, that uh, books of philosophy or books of, uh, of other religions or whatever in order to find truth. We have to let the Holy Spirit teach us, but the Holy Spirit works through His Word. The Holy Spirit uh, uh, has given us rules to follow, and the rule is that we compare Scripture with Scripture. And so we're not trusting what man teaches, we're trusting what the Bible teaches, but we have to follow the rules that God lays down as we find out what the Bible te- as we use the Bible to teach us. But thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi. Uh, there was a woman who called earlier, and she was very frightened about uh, her salvation. Yes. Yeah, I think maybe you should just tell her that there's, it's possible that God's will is that she should be sent to hell and that she should just be pleased about that. Oh, I would never tell anybody about that. Well, I would not? never tell anyone to be pleased that they're going to hell. I, I, that's, that's easy to say, but the fact is if you are not saved and the fear of God has come upon you and you really recognize the awfulness of hell, that's the last place that you want to go. And so you're going to be pleading God for mercy. And you're not going to be thanking him, Oh, Lord, I'm, I'm glad that you can, if it's your will, to send me to hell. That's, uh, that, uh, that, that I would never, never expect to have anybody come to God with. Oh, I don't know why you say that. I, well, maybe, God has... maybe you're able to say that, but I will not say that because hell is a terrible thing. Hell is super awful. And if it is God's will to send me to hell, so be it. But I'm sure not thankful that he's going to send me to hell. I'm, I'm, uh, I, uh, that, that would make a, uh, a mockery of what the gospel is. The gospel is that we plead for salvation, not that we thank him that we're going to hell. Well, you know, that after a hundred million years of hell, it's probably not going to be so awful anyway. Oh, that's what you say. That's not what the Bible says. And and so hell is not is not anything that we play games with or that we take lightly in any sense of the word. You know, sir, the the problem the the basic problem with everything you're saying is that your the a premise of all of what you're saying is that God is a satistic monster. That the, he was the Bible that, excuse that, me, excuse me. That is absolute blasphemy. God is not a sadistic monster. He is a God of integrity. He is a holy God. He is a righteous God. And his righteousness demands payment for sin. In fact, God is so righteous that when he paid for the sins of those that he came to save, he, when he paid for my sins, Every dirty, rotten, miserable sin that I would ever commit in my life was laid upon him. And, and then, uh, with having, been, uh, having those sins as well as the sins of all the others that he had planned to save, he had to bear the awful, Christ had to bear the awful wrath of God in making payment for those sins. And that payment had to be equivalent to all of these individuals he come to, came to save, spending an eternity in hell. That is the very highest love imaginable, that he would do that. Excuse but his, his righteousness demands that anybody who has not had their sins paid for, that they must stand for judgment and be examined, and, uh, and they... Uh, will endure hell. Now, all of us, as a matter of fact, if God had cast the whole human race, lock, stock, and barrel, into hell, uh, nobody could complain. We all deserve to go to hell. 
But we must never think lightly of hell or ridicule hell or think that it is something easy. It is, if you please read Deuteronomy 28, beginning in verse 16. Deuteronomy 28. These are figures, just pictures, describing ugly things on this earth in order to give us some sense of how awful hell is. Uh, read passages like uh, Revelation 14, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. Excuse me. Uh, may I say something now? Hello? Yes? Your God exacts infinite punishment for finite crimes which we could not help but commit. Well, you see, uh, who is who is the guilty one? Is it God who is guilty? Whenever you have those who are in rebellion, they always find the judge guilty or think they can find him guilty because they are alibying for their own crimes. But they are the criminals. We are the criminals. God is not the criminal. We are the criminal. So what position, how can we dare to criticize a perfectly righteous God? This, 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 is, uh, this is crazy. We better... We better listen to God and, and look at our sins and, and cry to God for mercy. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. Yes. How are you this evening? Very well, thank you. Uh, I would like one comment and one question, please. Yes. Uh, the comment would be in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. Revelation 12, verse 6, where it's talking about the woman that gave birth to the man-child, and then the woman fled in the wilderness where she hath the place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Now, what is your comment? My comment is this is a uh, guarantee the, the New Testament church, because in uh, verse 17, too, it sort of uh, keys in on this. Is that correct? Oh, well, the, you, you have to remember you, uh, about the word church. It, it, it is talking about the eternal, invisible church that exists forevermore. That is constant throughout the history of the New Testament. In fact, it's constant throughout the history of the world. That church is forever. But it is not talking here about the constancy of the corporate, uh, the corporate uh, external representation of the kingdom of God as we find it in the churches and congregations. God has other information to indicate that it finally uh, has finished its work, it comes to an end, it comes under the judgment of God, and then God finishes the work of the church through the, those who bring the gospel during the period of the latter reign. Yes. Uh, well, if, if uh, this woman is the corporate church, and then in chapter 17 in Revelation, verse 3, it said, So he carried me away in spirit into the wilderness, and I saw the woman. Uh, sit upon the scarlet colored beast and uh, in, in verse 5 it says that upon her forehead was mystery Babylon <clears throat> so isn't this proof that the corporate church is no, Babylon? No, excuse me the, the, the notice in, uh, in Revelation chapter 12 uh, it begins and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Now that is not a co talking about a corporate uh, representation of the kingdom of God. This is the eternal representation of the kingdom of God. Only the true believers are clothed with the sun. The sun is a synonym for the Lord Jesus Christ. We are clothed with his righteousness. The moon under her feet is a figure of speech indicating that the law no longer, the moon represents the law here, uh, has no longer any authority to send that woman to hell. Her sins have all been paid for. And she gave birth to the man-child. That is, Christ came from 
the uh, from the body of believers, the true believers that existed in the Old Testament days, as typified by Mary, who was actually the one that some individual finally had to be selected to be the actual uh, uh, mother of the Lord Jesus. And then that woman continues, and uh, and uh, the uh, again it's the it's the eternal invisible church that that God is caring for that uh, that uh, and that the dragon is trying to destroy. Now the fact is that 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 woman uh, exists within the corporate external church he d she does exist within it during the church age but but once the ch church age is over she the true believers are driven out but they still are the woman they're still in the wilderness of the world and they still function until the until the last day but in chapter 17, in verse 3, who is this woman in the wilderness then? Oh, well, in chapter 17, God there is, is uh, 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 the, there he's talking about the, the uh, corporate uh, visible representation of the kingdom of God. It's a harlot. It's a woman that sits on a scarlet colored beast and her has she has a name mystery babylon the great and it means it is the the churches and congregations that now have come under the rule of satan so that uh, because he now rules uh, therefore now it is called babylon that is not the same woman as the woman of revelation 12 still into the wilderness on uh, verse 3 well, you see, the wilderness is the world in which we live in, and both the eternal, invisible church dwells in the wilderness, because this world is a wilderness, and and we remain here until we go to be with Christ in heaven. So does the corporate, uh, uh, external church dwell in the wilderness but of course it will not go into heaven it only the true believers from that will go into heaven but it itself finally its work is done and it and it comes under the judgment of god okay uh i would like you to turn to jeremiah chapter 27 please jeremiah 27 and uh, verse 7, 8, and 9, does this refer to the church? Uh, uh, Christ is telling us to serve uh, Babylon and to serve them in bondage? No, this is talking about all the nations of the world. All nations, notice in verse 7, all nations shall serve him and will serve Satan and his son and his son's son until the very time of his land come and there are, and then many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of him and it came to pass that, that that the nation and kingdom which will not serve the same Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon and that will not put their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon that nation will I punish this is a this is an interjection into the whole story of God's dealing with the churches and congregations as they are typified by Judah and Jerusalem. But here in Jeremiah 27, God is dealing with all the nations of the world. And it really follows what, what he is interjected in Jeremiah 25, where he also talks about all the nations that finally uh, come under the wrath of God as he is talking there about the end of the very end of the world but it says that i uh, i will punish the nation that uh does not serve babylon in other words we're supposed to be under like the bondage of uh, babylon and still uh the uh true true uh, witness? No, the fact is that the nations have a function in the world. They, they must be obedient to those who rule over them. Now, normally the rulers of any nation, they're not believers. They're not children of God. They are, they're actually servants of Satan. And yet, politically, 
And civilly, we have to be obedient to them. We're not in rebellion against them. Uh, even the true believers who are out there in Babylon, in that sense, have to serve him, although we do not serve him spiritually, uh, the, the kingdom, the uh, uh, rulers of this world, spiritually, as, as when Satan sits in the church, then those who are there are, are worshiping or serving uh, Satan spiritually. With that, I'll have to say goodnight because we run out of time. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Family Stations Incorporated has featured Open Forum, a telephone talk program of biblical discussion with host Harold Kemp. You're invited to tune in every weekday at this time. All correspondence relating to the Open Forum should be sent to Family Stations Incorporated, Oakland, California, 94621. That's Family Stations Incorporated, Oakland, California, 94621. When writing, please indicate the call letters of this station. If you were not able to call in on this broadcast, we invite you to try again on a future Open Forum. Due to the nature of this type of call-in program, the opinions expressed are those of the participants. Open Forum is a production of Family Stations Incorporated.